This is the Sugar Beet Report, bringing you the latest information from NDSU throughout the sugar beet growing season. Today we're discussing some of the common soil-borne diseases that affect sugar beets. Our guest is Dr. Ashok Chanda, Extension Sugar Beet Pathologist with the University of Minnesota and Northwest Research and Outreach Center in Crookston, Minnesota. Ashok, what are some soil-borne diseases that affect sugar beet production in our growing area? The beets are planted a couple of weeks earlier this year compared to last year, which also means that the soil is slightly warmer, which is very conducive for soil borne disease of sugar beet. In our growing area, we typically worry about rhizotunia root rot, Aphenomyces root rot, and Fissure mellows. But out of three, rhizotunia is pretty widespread in our growing area. Why is rhizoctonia widespread, and what can growers do to manage it? The thing about rhizoctonia is it can infect not only sugar beets, but some of the crops that are grown in rotation, such as soybeans, corn, and edible beans. So the best strategy for managing rhizoctonia diseases is to have a seed with a seed treatment that's effective for a seedling phase of the disease, we call it damping up. And as the beets get to four to eight leaf stage, the growers can apply a fungicide such as as azoxystrobin alone or in different combinations. Most of the growers are doing a band application or a broadcast application. And in the last few years, our studies have indicated that either application is very good at managing rhizoctonia. What about managing of phanomyces? Ephanomyces is favored by warmer soil temperatures and also it needs lots and lots of moisture. You know, when you think of a rhizoctonia, it just needs a low to moderate moisture. And Ephanomyces can stay in the soil pretty dormant for up to 10 years because it can make these very tough walled spores that can survive in the soil under adverse conditions. And most of the sugar beet seed contains the seed treatment, which is tachycurrin, which is very effective for sealing phase of the disease. But several growers are also using 5 to 10 tons of waistline per acre, you know, which has been very effective for managing the root rot phase that's caused by Ephenomyces. How can growers take care of fusarium issues? There are certainly some fields which are hot spot for fusarium. And in the last few years, uh, we have seen some fusarium showing up early in the season, especially, you know, when it was very hot and dry. The thing about fusarium, you see some yellowing on the leaves. Sometimes it's only half of the leaf or the full leaf, and you don't see any symptoms on the surface of the root. You know, you have to cut these roots horizontally, and then you can see some darkening, which is nothing but the fusarium that's blocking the water transportation in the roads. The only thing that the growers can do for fusarium right now is make note of it, and then next time they grow the beets, they have to select a variety with genetic tolerance to fusarium. Are you offering sugar beet disease diagnosis this year? Yes, Bruce. Thanks to the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board, with the help of the funding from this board, we are able to offer this service to the growers again this year. You can talk to your agriculturist. If you have some problem beets in a particular field, they can pull some samples and uh, send it to our uh, sugar beet pathology lab in Crookston. We're located right next to the University of Minnesota Crookston campus. So typically we get back to the growers within 24 to 72 hours with the underlying problem so the growers can uh, stay ahead of the disease issues in particular fields. Thanks, Ashok. Our guest has been Dr. Ashok Chanda, Extension Sugar Beet Pathologist with the University of Minnesota and Northwest Research and Outreach Center in Crookston, Minnesota. This is the Sugar Beet Report, bringing you the latest information from NDSU throughout the sugar beet growing season.